I like the, uh, the post sweeter, bolder, softer. We're going to find out today by tasting these. And what we're actually tasting here for Michael's first ever whiskey, single barrel tasting, by the way, if you didn't catch that, two different things. We're going to start off on our 10 year old single barrel. And just to give you a little bit of background, Michael, the 10 year old was our first ever whiskey. The first product we put out was a 10 year old at 100 proof back in 2010. It was unlike anything the market had ever seen. Big, bold, huge dry flavors that aren't just hitting that spice centric profile that the rye whiskey drinker might be accustomed to, but in fact, taking that and turning it on its head. We've got the spice base, but we've got some sweetness. We've got a lot of great complexity going on in terms of mouthfeel. It's not just hitting your tongue, going down and saying, see you later. It's lasting on the finish. This rye whiskey really defined what the quintessential rye should be. And I think we've only really worked to expand upon that with our future releases, both after the 10 year and soon to come down the road. But with the 10 year itself, we truly encapsulate what it means to be a rye whiskey. And nothing does that better than the 10 year single barrel program. To put it quite simply, just a little background, the 10 year itself, the 10 on that bottle, it's a minimum entry level requirement. 10 years is the minimum age of a whiskey. It oftentimes goes up to 15, 17, 18 years old. The reason for that is it's not an age statement. It's a flavor profile. The 10 year flavor profile is all those things I mentioned and more. But what makes the 10 year single barrel so unique is we're able to take all these different batches of whiskey, sweeter, spicier, a little bit more rounded, a little bit more herbaceous. All these batches that we take a smaller percentage of and put into the regular 10 year, instead we can showcase on their very own. So we can give you these more unique, more flavorful in some ways, but definitely different and special casks of whiskey, allow you to taste them on their own and say, I want this as is, instead of going into the classic 10 year. And by doing so, you can really give yourself something that is A, cast strength, and B, unlike any other whiskey product that's gonna be out there. It's really the most exciting thing about my job is doing things like this. And I'm so, so glad to be here with you for that. The single, the single barrel uh, will be bottled at cask strength as opposed to the regular, to the blended 10? Indeed, and our cask strength for our 10 year may range from honestly under 100 proof, it's very rare, but it happens, to above 120 proof. It's gonna give us quite a range of flavor profiles. A lot of the times, a lower proof whiskey might drink much clean, cleaner, or sorry, a higher proof rather, whiskey may drink much more cleanly than a lower proof whiskey would. It's a matter of finding that perfect harmony of maturation with the wood extracts and the distillate over the course of 10 plus years. And I might mention too, it's worth noting that the whiskeys we're tasting right now are older than 10 years. Every whiskey we're tasting right now is actually 12 years old. Wow. So to that point, we're not just holding the best and all the stuff for ourselves. In fact, it's quite the opposite. We want the best, most unique stuff to get out there in front of you guys. And at cast strength, it's really gonna hold on to a lot of its inherent flavors in that bottle itself. It is each barrel is the, and if I'm using the wrong terms, I apologize, but is the mash bill the same? Yes. Across so, the board? So absolutely. But here's something that's interesting to note for our whiskey is that we're not just taking, you know, three, five, eight different barrels from one larger batch. In fact, what we do is we'll identify well over a year in advance what barrels are really showing the best flavor profile individually at eight, at nine, at 13 years perhaps. And those are flagged for the single barrel program. Those will go into that program and only be used for that. If they don't get picked by somebody like yourself, that tells us, guess what? Maybe it didn't have as many legs to stand up as we might have thought. So we're able to give these sort of one of a kind whiskeys, but let the consumer say, hey, this really wasn't what we we're looking for. In fact, we we're looking for something a bit spicier. And we can kind of come back and say, okay, how about these three? How about these five? Until we find that perfect version of the 10 year for your liquor store, for your restaurant, even for private consumers out there who are looking to get a barrel of 10 year for them and their bodies, something like that. It's a very real uh, opportunity out there. I think we should start tasting these whiskeys before we get too far into the chatting because nothing gets the lips moving a little bit like some good juice, right? <laughs> so we're dealing with three different samples of whiskey here. Again, all 12 years old, actually, 10 year minimum, but 12 years old, and we're looking at different proof points here. Which one would you like to start with yourself, Michael? 
Uh, well, the way that I've got them lined up, I have uh, barrel number 19629. Perfect. Up first. Likewise. I've got 85176 next, if you want to hit that one second. Uh, yes, I do. Yep. Awesome. All right. And just a little bit of background here, guys. So we're tasting three totally different whiskeys that are coming from different batches with different inherent flavor profiles at different proof points. For example, the whiskey that we're tasting first is barrel 19629, I know, very sexy numbering, at 108.5 proof. So we're looking at eight and a half proof points above the standard classic 10-year. And again, I just want to hit on what the classic notes of the 10-year are going to be. We're going to see a general spice forward profile, but we're not going to miss out on the sweetness, the vanilla extracts from the barrel, the caramel. Additionally, we're going to get a lot of just general aromatics from the rye itself. Some great spice characters, some herbaceous notes, a lot of mouthfeel presence. What we're going to look for in a single barrel might not hit any of these notes at all, or might just hit a couple of them, but I guarantee you we're going to know through and through which one of these is a winner, and it might be so difficult as we're going to have a tough time picking between the three, but that's the nature of a single barrel. It's tough to say which one of these is best when they're all just so damn good. And it really makes you feel a little, uh, little skeevy almost saying, yeah, you know what, whiskey, any other day I'd take you 10 times out of 10, but right now, no thanks. Just so not gonna, said, you're not going to make the cut. One of Exactly. You're not going to make the cut today. You're not going to make the cut. And just you know, it's few, really interesting as, I, as I'm looking at the three in, in front of me, one of them is, I'm going to try and see if, if this comes out, but one of them is particularly darker than the other. So right. Uh, this is uh, the first one. This is 19629. And you can see I'm getting that same effect here as well. Look at the dark. This is uh, 85062. It's, it's a couple shades darker. Exactly. I like that nice sort of deeper mahogany color. Yeah. Although color isn't always telling us what flavor you're going to get, it can be a good jumping off point. You know, it can give you an idea of some of the maturity. What, um, would, what would cause that? If they're all in the barrel for the same time, is it is it? barrel how you know uh, rack placement is it different woods no you're because you're using american oak right exactly so yeah. it's what's going to affect the, the the color extraction is actually the same set of variables that's going to affect every other level of extraction when it comes to flavor compounds if you look at it quite simply the color is extracted from the barrel the charred barrel itself much like a flavor like vanilla might be or a flavor like caramel or a spicier flavor we have X amount of the color compounds themselves in the wood, and it just might be that this one barrel is in a higher elevation in the warehouse. It's getting a little bit more heat. It's pulling mm -hmm. a bit more aggressively. That doesn't necessarily mean we're going to get all the other good barrel extracts, but it does mean that we're getting a lot of this one specific compound being the color compound itself. So I don't like to necessarily judge a whiskey based on color. For that reason, it can be very misleading especially when you expand to world whiskeys that can add caramel coloring. The mm. color of the whiskey can't really tell you anything. But that being said, especially in American whiskey, where we're using brand new American charred oak, the color is a decent indicator of at least how long it's been sitting in the barrel for. Generally speaking, if you've got a lighter colored whiskey, it tends to give us this idea that it hasn't really sat that long in the barrel. For us with these 10 year plus barrels, honestly, this is sort of a, a goofy thing to think about. My sample right here, that's a little bit darker of our second barrel, has actually some char floating in it. And that char, it's worth noting, we're pulling right out of the barrel with a thief. That char can absolutely affect the color of that whiskey and seem to be a bit darker. Um, which, you know, it's all these little things to take into account. Some people will come do a barrel tasting, take a sip and go, hmm, I think I got some food with that. And I'll tell you, yep, you got some fiber right there. You're good to go. Just uh, a few pointers in terms of actually tasting, especially because we're doing multiple different products here. When we're doing a private barrel tasting, it's just as important as it is in any other tasting to take your time and just be careful with your palate, preserve that palate. But even more so when we're talking about not just cast strength whiskey here, but cast strength well-aged rye. The amount of flavor that we're getting is going to absolutely ruin our palate if we don't treat it right. To that end, what I tend to recommend to people is First sip of the whiskey, just try to take a very, very small sip. In fact, the smallest sip you've ever tasted. I like to take such a small sip that I can still have a full conversation with you while experiencing the flavor. We want to acclimatize our palate to that. We don't want to drink half this glass down and really just destroy our palate with ethanol, because guess what? We've got three to four to 10 more potentially mm -hmm. samples just like that to work with. It's about taking your time, 
having potentially a palate cleanser on like some lamb crackers, whatever really suits your boat. For me, water's a must, clean that, clean that palate out. But more importantly than anything else is know that the whiskey you just tasted is gonna affect the whiskeys you're gonna taste. Simple way to put it is if I just took a huge shot of Lagavulin 16 here, smoky ass scotch, I would certainly keep in mind that for the next five whiskeys I taste, that medicinal iodine-y smoky taste I'm getting probably isn't coming from these glasses. So with that in mind, I'd like to start tasting here. I mean, I'll be lying if I said I didn't actually start nosing these and tasting these before we hopped in air. And I'm seeing some fantastic, beautiful things. Michael, I did mention this earlier, but for everybody out there, I don't like to put words in anybody's mouth. I like to hear what you're tasting and then kind of give back. And I'd like to do that here with you, as long as that's all right. I know first time might be a little daunting, but I think we got this. And I like, I think I trust your palate. I like the look of you. I like the way you're nosing, you know. Really taking your time getting to know this whiskey. On uh, the on um, one nine six two nine, so that's the first one, which just on the nose, there seems to be a little bit more. Uh, it's more like herbaceous, like fresh ginger. Mm. Really, uh, really pretty. It's not overly woody. It's not super yeah, intense, exactly. punchy, and I yeah. like that. You know, our ten year old might be seen as a bolder facing rye, and it is in many ways, but when you get to taste one of the whiskeys that makes it up, there's that prettier aspect, that softer herbaceous you mentioned. Oftentimes some of our more herbal whiskeys are gonna be a bit floral as well, perhaps a bit sweet, but not overly so, you know. And this whiskey's a bit lighter in color too, which again, yep. yes. doesn't always tell us something, but we're not tasting quite as much wood in this, or at least I'm not. It's not overly dominated by tannin, by oak or anything like that. The distillate character really shines. And that color actually helps us kind of come to terms with that in a sense. It doesn't have as much extract from there. Mm. Man, that's fantastic on the palate too. 108.5 proof, I'm getting no negative sensations. It is a bit sweeter on the palate than the nose for me. What else are you getting there? It, um, it is, um, there's a, at, you know, at 108 proof, there, there is a little bit of a, a zip at the end, but I mean, you would expect that, of course, at that, at that level. It lets you know it's there, right? You know, it's, it's not overwhelming. It's comforting. And as I let this sit too, the rye spice really develops nicely in that glass. It starts to come out, not aggressively, but it lets you know that this is a hundred percent rye whiskey. Right? Yeah. Uh, you're definitely picking up. Um, well, now I'm picking up quite a bit of that, the very, I think, typical spice, uh, a lot of like a kind of like white pepper. Yeah, absolutely. Man, those herbaceous notes though really dominate the nose in such yeah, a nice way sure. like across the board. And it's not just, you know, sometimes people hear herbs and they hear rye and they think dill, partially because of MGPI. I'm not getting any of that actually. No, none of that. Nope. Yeah, it's a bit more sagey. It's a bit more minty even. It's yes. really, really covering yeah, mint, the board in mint, herbal tone. Mint is a good call. Yep. Yeah. I feel like this would have a cooling sensation like mentholatum, which is yeah, my mother. Yeah. yeah, exactly. But I know for a fact that if I were to smear this on my lips, that wouldn't necessarily be the case. <laughs> Although it might taste delicious, let's be honest. Man, this, I, yeah, this is a whiskey for me that is definitely a bit of an outlier. When it comes to the tenure itself, this isn't the whiskey that's really making up the bulk of the tenure. In fact, this is what we might call a flavoring component because it has such a unique specific flavor that's going to carry across in such a specific way in the blend itself that oftentimes the second we taste something like this, we say single barrel, boom, because we want mm. people to be able to at least experience that. Whether or not you or anybody else ends up selecting this barrel, the fact is you get to build your knowledge of whiskey and rye whiskey and cast drink rye whiskey by doing something like this, by tasting vastly different whiskeys. It, does, it almost has like, a, it's almost... I don't want to say it. it's not, and I mean in in the nicest way, it's like a stripped down kind of version, if you you know, where you're not getting so much char influenced, you're not getting Absolutely. so much oak influenced. Like this is what rye whiskey, kind of left to its own devices, should taste like. Yeah, and it's yeah, it's not as refined, it's not as complex per se, but it's not any worse for that. In fact, mm -hmm. I'd almost say it's better for that reason. It stands yes, out yeah. more, you know, in the way that we look at blending in terms of flavor components is let's say I've got a barrel like this with a ton of herbal quantities on a bar graph. Our standard is down here. This barrel has a lot of extra compounds. However, every other barrel is going to be a little bit less, maybe a little bit more, but closer to that mean, if you will. So therefore, if we take this barrel, 
19629 and we dump it into a vat of 25 barrels, all which had a lower level of herbal tone, suddenly that dominating herbal note just gets squanched down and suddenly it's just a nice addition. And if you think of that, like all of the different inputs, the spicier inputs, the earthier inputs, the sweeter inputs, they're all sort of meeting that general trend of evenness of 10 year old, which is a good thing for somebody who's going in and buying a standard bottle of 10, they expect it to be the same. But when we're talking about a single barrel, that unique expression of that herbal tone, I don't wanna mute that. I wanna save that, put it aside, let the 10 year ride on its own with all these other fantastic input barrels. But give this barrel to somebody like yourself. And I expect that we're gonna find very similar differences in terms of the regular 10-year and the two other barrels we've yet to taste, but in terms of the actual flavor, night and day compared to 19629 right here. Mm. Ooh, and it's really opening up really nicely on the nose of the aromatics too. I'm getting some really nice waxy vanilla, oh, sort it's of just, honeysuckle, oh yeah. It's really, uh, it's amazing, because. You know, I, I, my background is wine, and, and okay. I've kind of recently come into spirits. Um, but I hadn't thought of the the spirit changing in the glass the way that wine does. You know, we, we talk about aerating oh, yeah. uh, wines to, to let their flavors come out, and you just don't think that that would work for something of such a high proof. But but you're right. absolutely, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, it, it's changed. Now that the ginger to me is a little bit more pronounced, but you're getting absolutely. That, the vanilla is starting to pop now too. It's becoming a little bit more, you know, complex in a sense. Yeah. And I would say, and my father is an absolute wine snob, so I grew up on that sort of mentality. And I'd say it's almost more important with whiskey and spirits in general to let that oxidative effect come in, especially with a brown barrel-aged spirit. The reason is that oxygen, much like in wine, is going to interact significantly with the flavor compounds and transform them. But I wouldn't say much like we do in wine where we open a bottle and we wait for 30 minutes, we wait for an hour to let it settle. In fact, part of the beauty of the whiskey tasting experience, in particular with a cast strength single barrel product like this, is watching it grow. I would highly recommend always pour that glass, take a nose out of it, take a sip if you feel like it, but know that in two, five, 10, 15 minutes, it's going to change, it's going to grow. And that's the experience of whiskey. That's honestly what got me into whiskey was watching that whiskey develop and change in the glass over time and saying, oh my God, this vanilla flavor wasn't there 12 minutes ago, but now it's all I can smell. In 10 minutes from now, it'll be muted so much that I can get something else completely different coming out of that. You know, Wine has definitely taken that idea of fineness and really gotten a chokehold on it. But in reality, the beverage alcohol industry as a whole deserves that same exact recognition. Every glass should be looked at with such scrutiny as a fine Bordeaux is because there is so many layers of flavor here to dissect and to open up and to show themselves. And one last note too, time helps beautifully, air helps beautifully, but water actually works. Yes. Quite well. yeah. And not adding in a ton of water, you know, proofing it down too much, not adding in the smallest drop ever, but you know, it doesn't have to be the most scientific thing in the world. Add a drop, add two, add five. Just notice the fact that your whiskey is changing. You might like it more, you might like it less, but it's that idea that there's so much flavor to offer here, particularly in a cast rank whiskey, where part of the reason I'm so excited about selling cast rank barrels is I'm giving somebody the ability to say, I love this at 105.9, or I love this at 108.6, or I love this at 100.1, or I love this after I pour some amount of water into it. I don't know exactly how much, but it works for me. You know, It's finding that sort of niche for everybody where it really works. So I'm going to grab a second glass right here just to keep my nose going, keep my palate engaged. You yep. better believe I'm going to be hitting the first whiskey time and time again as we taste. And actually, as we taste these next couple of whiskeys, we've got a sort of library that we've, we're building here where we've got our sort of, I mean, I'd identify 19629 based off a lot of the characteristics you put out, the herbaceous character of it. It's a bit lighter in terms of its rye spice, but it's not a light whiskey. It's got a lot of flavor to it, but there's sure. softer flavors. The sweetness definitely comes out. It's got great palate presence, but it's very different from the regular 10 year. It's kind of picking up to me. It's picking up a little bit of those, like that Coca Cola note to it. Oh you know, yeah, yeah. You know, where it's, uh, it's yeah. really it's changed so dramatically in, since we've uh, just started. It's pretty cool. That, co that cola note is super nice, and that does go along the like herbaceous notes, but almost a rooty note as well, with a little bit of floral character, with some sweetness. Yep. Um, it's it's funny you say that. I was actually just talking to one of my coworkers yesterday, saying, "Hey, you know, it'd be great if we got a bunch of different types of cola." 
and did a flight and just did a tasting of them and you know noticed the differences between them. I love cola as a tasting. Of them. That's great. Yeah, I like this whiskey a hell of a lot. And it's so funny, you know, the first whiskey you taste might seem like the greatest thing in the world, but by the time we get to three, our thoughts might be quite a bit different. So we just tasted that 108.5, 12-year-old, 100%, or 100, 10 fruit, sorry, 10-year-old single barrel, got there eventually, uh, damn near 100% rye by match bill. We are now moving on to my second glass, at least, is 85176, 105.9 proof. And again, Proof does not always dictate smoothness, to put it as simple as that, nor does it dictate flavor. And we're gonna take a second here, folks, just to really experience this flavor. Oh, man. One of the problems with a lot of our private barrels is I could just nose them all goddamn day long. <laughs> I, you know, it's like, oh, I should probably take a sip of this eventually. It's just, it's so appealing. The flavor changes over time. It really grows quite a bit if you throw some water in there in particular. And it's not that I don't want to sip, it's just that I forget to take a sip. Oh, it's just so earthy. Like just it is, right? Almost like you, you feel like you're at the farm, perhaps. Not, <laughs> not that I've ever been, Peter, not yet, anyway. But you're, yeah, that's a good, I mean, we'll get you up there, absolutely. In <laughs> fact, in fact, you would be, we would be having this conversation in person after probably, you know, a night of fun and a night of fun to come were things a bit more normal, should we say. But I absolutely expect to see you on the farm, hopefully within the next year, for barrel number three or four, or whatever it is with you guys. Yeah, sounds- Actually, quantity-wise, it might be five. But yeah, you have to experience the farm because it is truly a farm. You know, it's enough to talk about it right now and you think, oh yeah, okay, it's a farm. But you get there and you're like, okay, Pete was right. You know, this is a farm. <laughs> there's pigs, you know, there's grain growing everywhere. We're literally using renovated dairy barns for bottling for distilling, for everything oh, wow. like that, you know, and not, not for a gimmick at all. It was more of a cost savings initiative. You know, here's a pre-existing structure. We have to spend less money to raise it up than we do to tear it down and build something up. And it does have that charm to it as well. Yeah, this is a much earthier, very different whiskey, a bit more rye centric in some ways, I'd say. Maybe what you'd expect out of a rye if you were thinking just along that spicier vein of rye. It's almost richer in flavors because the flavors are a bit more pronounced. It's got less of a range of flavors, at least at first glance, at first nose, at first taste. But I think that with time, especially with some water, this guy would open up quite nicely and change its tune. I think we'd get a lot of sweetness coming out of it. It uh, Actually, it's interesting because for, me, for a, a whiskey that's a little bit less alcohol, it feels weightier than the first barrel. Like oh, yeah. Absolutely. Dense. Yeah. Yeah, it's got way more palate weight. I can feel it there for a bit longer as well. How do you feel about the finish on this one? Well, it's, it's muscular, for, you know, yeah. for sure. I, I like, yeah. you know, this is, uh, whereas I thought the first one was um, elegant. Um, yeah, I use this term a lot when I'm kind of trying to describe scotch because I think, it, you know, when you're talking about Highlands versus Isla. Oh, you know, yeah you're talking about feminine versus masculine. Absolutely. I think we've just kind of gone to the masculine side here. No, I I couldn't agree more. This one's a bit, you said prettier earlier, which is a good term to describe, I'd say lighter, more delicate flavors, more feminine flavors we might attribute that to. Whereas that's, and that's a great analogy, that Lowlands versus Isla, where we've almost gone from that Lowlands, that, you know, potentially Campbelltown style, a little bit lighter to something a bit punchier, a bit beefier. Yes, punchier, yes. Exactly. And punchy ryes are not something we hang our hat on, but it's definitely a standard of whistle pig of the tenure at least, where we've got a higher proof point, which is going to give you a lot more flavor, and the flavors we're giving are a bit bolder. However, this guy isn't drinking like the regular tenure to me at all. It's even punchier. It's even more aggressive in flavor. Yes. Still, I mean, the finish from glass one has been completely overwhelmed by the finish from glass two. It's a very weighty whiskey. And now, Michael, in terms of your uh, fans of your brand, Table and Vine, how would you think most people are drinking these whiskeys? Do you have mostly neat drinkers? Are we making cocktails at home? Is it a mix of both? I think when it comes to the the better whiskeys and bourbons, um, 
there is they're drinking them either neat or you know maybe maybe some rocks perfect okay uh, but the, the fun thing though too is you know we we find more and more as people have been confined for i guess three months now oh my god right you know they're they're much more willing to branch out and you know i think they've gotten tired of if whatever they drink oh, yeah. so now they're you know so now of course mixology has become the big thing but you know i i feel like we we've had a really we have a great customer base that when they're coming in and they say, oh, I want to make an old fashioned or I want to make a Manhattan and they're buying a 50, 60, $70 bottle of whiskey or bourbon. And you tell them, okay, but you, you can't buy the cheap vermouth now. Like you can't. Yeah, right, right. You, you have to that. elevate this cocktail. Game, right? yeah, you, you can't do that to the poor whiskey. It, it's not <laughs> there. And so I think we've really seen this, um, this kind of uptick in, in overall quality where people are saying, you know what, if I'm going to, if I'm going to make a great drink with a great whiskey, every ingredient needs to be great. That's good. And I like that mentality, right? It's that sort of shift towards being more serious about your cocktails. Exactly. You know, it's not, it is more serious. They're more classics. And, and I think when you, when you kind of explain that to a customer, I, I, I feel like they're getting it better. Yeah. Like, yeah. Right. Where you say, Hey man, you know, you're making a drink with three ingredients. It, it, three ingredients they they need to be the best they're gonna you're, shine you're gonna taste every aspect of it you know if you're making oh, yeah. a you're throwing a margarita together with you know high, high fructose corn syrup mix and all that stuff no you don't you don't need to use don julio but yeah if you're making a true margarita then you should just use agave Absolutely. you know and then the same only behooves, yeah. i you know so that's been that's been really fun and encouraging uh with the customers because I think that they do rely on us. They trust us. Uh, yeah. You know, is what it boils down to. Um, our barrel program has just grown and grown and grown every year um, because I think, you know, <laughs> the guys before me have made great selections. So, you know, uh, fingers crossed. Oh, anyway, I know we're on our way to a winner here. And I mean, just based off your company itself, you guys aren't picking barrels that you like. It's not Michael likes this one the best. Boom. It's, you know, your customers. Yeah. You know they're neat drinkers that like rocks and are now branching into cocktails. And when we pick a barrel, every one of these whiskeys is going to suit itself a little bit differently. One might be a straight meat pour, doesn't work in cocktails because it gets completely lost. Typically, yeah. though, we're trying to build something out that really works for your people. And I think we've definitely got a nice range here that covers the bases. But that point earlier about making the cocktail with better ingredients is so huge. I mean, it's the same thing as you wouldn't, you know, make a beautiful steak sandwich with filet and then use just Wonder Bread for the bread. You'd probably get something a little fancier to elevate <laughs> that game, you know. It just brings everything down quite a bit. I love that mentality. It's not a don't use this more expensive spirit because you're going to ruin it. In fact, that's not the case at all. You can right. make some of the best cocktails with some of the higher end spirits because, quite simply put, they've got a better flavor profile. In the case of tenure, it tends to stand out a little more in cocktails. So it does actually work pretty well in a variety of cocktails. But if you're using other inputs that are less than good, let's say, it's going to ruin everything. You know? yes. So yep. that's huge right there. And that's part of the reason you know, I get behind somebody like you is it's quality. You guys are quality at the end of the day. You, know, you want people to experience their spirits, their wine, their beer, whatever it may be, in the best way possible. And that might mean saying the, the uncomfortable thing. Hey, don't buy that twelve dollar vermouth. Buy this thirty dollar instead because you'll thank me. You know, yes, it is. It's you know, there's I. It's kind of a. We talk about this internally quite a bit. You know, if if you want to buy Jack Daniels, you, you can go to any store in Massachusetts and you're going to find Jack Daniels. You don't. Okay. Not that we mind, but you don't come to us to buy Jack Daniels. Well, we hope that you do, but you come to us to buy single barrel whistle pig you come to us to buy the things that that when you walk in and say i want to make a really good cocktail our staff is going to say you need this you need this and you need this and here's how so, you do it yeah and there you can't you know you, you can i guess pay for that but you can't really pay for that that's you know setting yourself so apart from the oh what do you want you want some vermouth there it is you know yeah, over there. Totally different. Shelf. yeah oh yeah and i actually used to come from the retail environment myself so i can't help but appreciate that even more because it's the difference between having somebody come back for their bottle of Jack Daniels, Absolutely. but then branch out a little bit. And now suddenly a year later, they're drinking whistle pig versus, you know, staying on Jack and moving to Jack honey, you know, for the rest of their <laughs> life or something like that. So um, with that said, what are your impressions after a little while of 85176? Which we can also refer to as barrel number two. Or, or barrel number two, <laughs> it's a little easier. <laughs> um, I, I think it still has that, that density. 
Right. That right. Week. I think I, myself, I think it might be a little bit more challenging, but not necessarily in a bad way. Mm. Yeah, that weight is huge. This is a whiskey for a whiskey drinker, for a cast mm. strength whiskey drinker. I think it has a bit more of that finishing presence in terms of bite, in terms of that sharpness. Again, not in an overly negative way than the first barrel did, despite yeah. the fact that it's a good deal lower in terms of proof. I think there's this really, um, and again, it's that earth, it, and I use this in a, in a very positive way. There's this, this earthy, like clean dirt, if that oh, makes yeah. sense. Yeah, the way that I, no, no, that's a perfect description. I, I've actually, on my journey to describe these flavor profiles, likened it to a very specific thing. And I usually don't like to do super personal tasting notes, but it's basically the exact smell and flavor you get in a sort of nice wooded forest with a lot of moss after the rain. And in fact, yeah. I've gone so far as to put it in my mouth and it tastes just like it. And it's not unpleasant. It's especially when coupled with other flavors, some drier flavors, some sweeter flavors and give it complexity. It's a very nice flavor profile. It's very unexpected. And it actually does work incredibly well in cocktails, but it is quite a bit like fresh earth, you know, this sort yes. of fresh. And that's in part coming from the rye itself, the inherent face quality in rye whiskey, as well as the maturation period coming from the cask. But more importantly, this idea of a character that you may be familiar with in wine, but it's more of a cognac, armagnac term called rancio. Rancio is this air of maturity, and it's a mushroomy, earthy, yes. almost like you're in the cellar in terms of wine cellars or cognac cellars, that feeling of being in the cellar, that feeling of maturity, and it's unmistakable for any other flavor. It's not the flavor of specifically dirt, but it has that same age, that same richness to it, in a sense, as dirt might, you know? It does. It, do, it reminds me of, you know, again, kind of falling back on what I know about, about wine. It, it's when you're trying to describe, you know, really good burgundy. Yes, exactly. And, yeah. and you're telling people, no, 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 you, really, you want this to taste like a pile of dirt, please. Yes, exactly. It. Maybe with some brambles sort of torn into yeah. it, you know, some, yeah. <laughs> so when people, it's like, you know, when you use the term, you know, barnyardy or it doesn't sound appealing, but, but I mean, it, gosh, this, it, this is a, it's growing on me more and more. Oh yeah. Again, the first one, I, I stick to that kind of softer, uh, gentler, uh, whiskey, if you will. And then this is just much, much, everything just seems to be amplified. As this sits in the glass, I'm appreciating it more and more. It's opening yeah. up, it's giving me a little bit more. And again, that amplified characteristic, it's a bit more elevated. The flavor is a bit more present. And as a flavor guy myself, I definitely appreciate that. I don't know about yourself. Absolutely. And again, let's go back to that color comment earlier. This was the darker whiskey, correct? Uh, not on my end. Okay. So, okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. So great. I'm glad you said that because I was very confused by your comment earlier. I was like, uh, you know, I think this, so we're on the same page with- Oh no, so, uh, and it's a little hard because my table is dark and my paper is yellow, but so kind of the, the first two, in, in the first, first two, say barrel one and two, yep. barrel one is just a shade darker than yes, barrel. Yes, it's got that nice mahogany sort yes. of amber color. Yeah. But then barrel three, which we haven't touched upon yet, is noticeably darker than the and, other. Yep, and that's the one that I've got a bunch of barrel char floating around in actually. So. Oh, okay, oh, all yeah. right. But you know, it just goes to show, I would typically expect to have a much darker whiskey if we're talking American whiskey with no barrel finish with these deeper, earthier flavors, because some of them are coming from the cask itself. But in reality, the color doesn't really tell us so much in that way. Color is a little more useful when we're talking scotch and we're talking sherry finish. And we're saying, was it finished for two years or 12 years? That yeah. color is gonna be pretty nice at two, pretty dark at 12, but it's a notable tell. Whereas with American whiskey, again, something as simple as the char level, if I have a char one, that's still a charred barrel, but it's significantly less charred than a char four would be. And it's gonna give much less color compound. So I could give you a 20 year old char one aged whiskey and a five year old char four aged whiskey. And just by looks alone, you would say the char four for five years is an older whiskey. It could definitely be deceiving right there. Hmm. So I'm liking this whiskey a lot. I think I've got a pretty good base on it. I'm, I'm thinking that these are gonna to continue to open up nicely as we taste through glass number three, but I'm itching to get an idea of what number three tastes like myself. Now I poured this at the start of the meeting. So I've had some time to open up a little bit but, ooh, nice, okay. So this is barrel 85062, and it's at 106.9 proof. So we're a bit above proof-wise our second barrel we sampled, and we're a bit under our first barrel that we sampled. And I'm, you know, just for clarification, because I actually, my sample says 109.6. 109.6, okay, gotcha. That's my mistake. Okay. Just I wrote one. it wrong, okay, yeah. I just looked at my glass, and it says 109.6. I wrote 106.9 in my notebook. So time to change that back. So this is our highest proof sample right here, actually. Yes, 109.6 proof. And it's definitely not nosing like it's the highest proof sample to me, off the bat. Man, that's good. Wow. That 
is that's that's kind of textbook. Yeah, exactly. I'm I'm searching for the words to say about like, well, it could have this, but I'm struggling right here. Yeah, this man. I'd like to hear what you have to say first, but I'm just going to keep on nosing it and tasting it until I get done. In fact, I might just nose and taste this for the rest of this uh, video. Really, I mean, it's just tons of it's just tons of vanilla, tons of that spicy, spicy pepper. Mm. Carries through the palate too with that nice spice character, but it's still creamy. Yeah. But I, and at at the highest proof, you, I mean, obviously it's got heat to it because they all do, but it's not like it's burning. No, not at all. And this could be a hundred proof or hundred twenty proof, and I would not be. It's one of those whiskeys where it, whatever the proof point is, it does not drink like a cast strength whiskey, but in a good sense. That's almost one of my ethos is, is cast strength doesn't just mean high proof. In fact, it means quite the opposite. Cast strength means this whiskey deserves to be drank at this proof. Quite simply put for me, it doesn't burn the back of the palate. It gives you a positive flavor experience. It gives you something there's, to think about. There's this beautiful, like keeping in mind that it's about 85 degrees <laughs> and near 100% humidity. There's this beautiful warmth that is just left behind when you're like, it, it, it finishes so smooth. It does. It's there. It's holding me. And I'll oh, say yeah. this. I'm in my 71 degree apartment right now. Very nice. And it's drinking just as nicely. And it's got that warm. It's a hug. It's that nice sort of, it's not a burn. It's not sharp, it's not negative in any way, but it's something that if it weren't there, I think we'd be missing something. You know, it's, yes. a, it's definitely an element of this whiskey. Man. I'm t it, wow. It just keeps going. Like we talk about in wine again, falling back. I want to know, we, we, we talk about like long finishes and, and how they just, the finish just gets more mature. Like all of a sudden now there's caramel on your mm -hmm. on my palate. You know, there's a sweetness, but without like a sugar sweet. Um, right. Wow. This guy's the whole package for me. I mean, yeah. without being too complex so that we lose specific notes, everything you're saying, 100% true. It's got that sweetness, but it's not a sugary sweetness. That's coming for me on the nose in this nice sort of honeysuckle, almost Sauternes-like way on the palate as well in a general air of sweetness. But it's more rye forward than anything else, especially on the palate. The spice takes center stage for sure. It actually has... For me, a lot of those herbaceous notes from barrel number one, just a bit more muted because it's got other flavors kind of taking front and center. The fit, and I'm getting actually a nice hint of orange to burnt orange on the back palate, on the mid palate as it sort of finishes. That's a really sort of pleasant whiskey from start to finish right here. There's, um, yeah, there's definitely some citrus notes. There's, oh, yeah. again, more of that, like you had mentioned earlier, stage, but it's almost like a rosemary. I mean, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Oh, yeah. Huh, interesting. Funny, rosemary is something that in my mind is so specifically for steaks that I'm hand searing and basting, but I never think about it in any other oh my God. with steak. But it's almost like a rosemary based steak for me in a sense. It's a rosemary is a great garnish for cocktail. Oh, yeah. oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I'm not as much a mixologist as some others out there, but I oh. love it when people make it for me. And also, not to change topics too much, but like scallops on rosemary skewers. Ooh. If, you're, if you're a seafood person. Now, correct me here. Are these skewers themselves made out of rosemary wood, or is it some sort of rosemary flavored infusion? In the, in no, the you you take you, you buy rosemary at the at Big Y, nice. and you, you kind of like you, you take you no, pick off the lower leaves and you leave okay. the upper leaves uh, the needles, and you okay. just use those as the skewer. And that just bleeds right into that. Damn, oh fantastic! God. I'm into that. I like that a lot. I think this whiskey's just got me excited, to be honest. Yeah, this whiskey too. I could see standing up in various formats. Throw some cubes in here. I think it would actually potentially enhance the flavor in certain ways. Now, it doesn't have a bite to tamp down, but it'll help sort of express certain flavors a little more specifically, like that sweetness, like that spice. And then additionally, as the cube melts, that water is going to change the sort of makeup of the whiskey. I love this meat, but I think it could definitely stand up to a nice cube there, a little slower dilution. Additionally, yeah. that spice character is going to carry through in most cocktails that you're going to be using rye as a base for. And believe it or not, I would love to put this in a tiki cocktail. I think that spice would carry through so nicely along okay. with that sweetness. In a what kind of cocktail? I'm sorry, you missed that. In a tiki cocktail. Tiki cocktail? Yeah, oh yeah. I, that's what I thought you said. But <laughs> exactly, yeah. No, tiki, you, you, would, you would be surprised at the versatility of rye whiskey in tiki. Mostly because tiki is a bit more involved. You know, we're not dealing with three ingredients typically. It might be 10, but that whiskey is still going to be front and center. The spice character, the wood character is going to be there, but it's going to be accentuated by notes that we actually naturally get from the barrel, coconut notes, sweeter vanilla notes, mm. even just tropical fruits, which aren't typically going to be the main flavor of rye that are certainly going to be present in various styles. Look no further than our 12-year-old for a good example of that. Man, so, I mean, man, Barrel three is really grabbing me by the heels here, but I'm doing my due diligence here and absolutely going through the rest because now we've got a better idea of what we're working with here. And I'm going back to barrel one with a totally different mindset. And it's actually showing me a bit different uh, 
profile than I did get originally, but I'm still getting that herbaceousness front and center first yeah. and foremost. That's huge. I'm gonna have to pull a sample of this one for myself to save. And it's funny too, after tasting through the three, going back to number one, I'm definitely picking out the negatives a bit more intensely because I've seen the more rounded sort of production, if you will. Mm. This might be one of those where you, when you know, you know. I've had yeah. groups that have eight barrels, they're gonna pick two of them, they taste one and two. They know that one and two are gonna be the ones throughout. And you know, it may be the case that no barrels are better. It may be the case that barrel five is amazing, but those two flavor points are hitting just what they want, but it just doesn't matter. Ooh. Yeah, going yeah, going back to one, I, I, it, it's almost. Uh, I'm glad we tasted barrel three last because it just seems to be to me. It seems to be the rock star so far. I think barrel three would have skewed us in a certain way if we tasted yeah, exactly. it first. Yeah, and this was just for everyone's knowledge, absolutely not by design. We completely randomly poured this. If you heard at the beginning, I was like, "Hey, what do you think? Eight five one seven six next." Just so happens that this third one. I mean, I'm thinking this. I think Michael's thinking this based off the words that are coming out of his mouth. But yeah. we've got a winner here, man. We may have a better winner in the other two, which is why we're gonna give them more than their due diligence. But, oh man, this is what the 10 year single barrel program is all about, is really finding these unicorns amongst the herd of unicorns, because these are all <laughs> fantastic whiskeys, but what's that last unicorn that's gonna stand out and really make us say, all right, you know what, one and two, see you later, you know, get out of here. Or in another case, four and five, get out of here. Man. Yeah, this is a whiskey I can nose all night. And you know, if you call me in three hours, you can guess what I'll be doing. Oh, it's just, it, I think it hits all the points that you're looking for. You know, where you, you, you had touched on it earlier, Peter. Like I don't, I'm not picking a barrel for me. Yeah, I'm okay. for I think are, in this, when I taste barrel number three, when I taste barrel number 85062, to me, this is what people are, this is what people want. I love it, man. I love it. And I mean, even at face value, this is going to hit the most palettes probably the best because it's a bit more versatile, but you know your people, you know what they want. You know, I could never, ever have said out of these three whiskeys, yeah, I like this one the best, but this one's going to be best for table and buying. I don't know your people, you know, yeah. to make those generalized assumptions is all well and good, but to know specifically, to be able to take a, a whiskey, take a sip or five and say, this is exactly what my people want. That's what the private barrel program is all about, no matter what distillery or what account it's going to be. It's about personalizing the whiskey giving somebody a version of might be whistle pig might be another brand but of in this case tenure that really is that exclusive and there might be other barrels that taste kind of like this similar to it they have some of the same sweetness some of the same spice character but there isn't really any other barrel that's going to hit like this actually i'd encourage you to at some point take these samples you have and taste them against your past barrel picks and see just how different they are with the idea that these all go into tenure all 10, 15, 25 different batches of different flavors all go into tenure. And you might've just gotten this one one year and this one one year. And in fact, you might've tasted from the same batches the same couple of years, but a certain barrel might not have hit your palate quite the right way. Or it might not have really said, this is table and buying to you quite in the way that barrel number three is for both of us, I would think here. And I'm gonna do one last proof of concept right here, which is add a couple drops of water in and really see how things open up. Let's see if I can reach this without breaking things. Excellent. So a little bit of water will change, quite simply put the chemical composition and change the flavor threshold of certain flavor compounds. So quite simply put, if there was a ton of vanilla in this whiskey, we diluted it down so the overall percentage of vanilla contribution is that much less which might mean that a certain more herbaceous note or a woodier note that was overshadowed can now kind of come out and play. It's one of the fun reasons to add water. And it's not, okay, that's great. So I added in a, a good amount of water to this, probably at least three or four proof points to reduce it. And I'm not really losing a ton of flavor. It doesn't smell thin. It's got that great palate to it still actually. And that's huge. You don't want to really have a whiskey that, no, with a grain of salt, I enjoy the hell out of a whiskey that a cast drink drinks beautifully, but I think it should also stand up to time, stand up some water in the glass, and this really does. I'm actually getting a bit more of that spice character. It's really mm -hmm. staying with me. The warmth is actually, it hasn't increased, but it's really increased its pleasantness in a sense, where I'm getting it back palette, I'm getting it on finish. Man. It, it's such a, it, it's such a um, pleasant drink. I mean, again, you're talking about something that's 100 and, 109 proof. 109, yeah, a damn near 110 proof. Yep. Oh yeah. Right, just shy of 110. And you feel like you could, you know, when the sun goes down tonight, start a bonfire sit around the fire and just sip, 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 and be pretty content. This is one of those where you better buy at least two bottles because honestly, you know, and I've had this happen to me so many times, 
you get some friends over. Now, granted, times are a little bit different right now. Maybe you get friends over a couple months from now, but it's one of those things where, you know, you got to taste them. It's that good. They're whiskey buffs. They might not even like whiskey that much, but they appreciate it. And they take a sip and they want a second glass. And before you know it, the bottle's freaking gone by the end of the night. And lo and behold, all you wanted was to have this bottle of single barrel for the next five years, 10 years to just take a little sip of every now and then. You know, it's one of those absolute winners. I always see actual store owners themselves who are like, oh man, you know, my private stash of the first single barrel is finally gone. And I'm kicking myself because I gave a bottle to Jim Bob last year and I gave a bottle to, you know, and it's like, yeah, these things are, you know, in a way they're more exclusive than something like a boss hog because these cannot be repeated. There might be some other iteration of them, but it's that specific unique flavor profile, you know, that's not really going to hit like anything else. And again, even more importantly, is specific to you guys. That's the biggest part for me. That's a pretty interesting way of looking at it though. Like it, it will, it'll never be at this point again, right? It'll never taste as, you know, if you left it in the barrel for exactly. five more years. Or it, five more weeks. Even. Five more, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's a, I call it the magic of maturation just for a nice, simple cliche buzzword, but it's, it's the magic of maturation. It's the fact that you can take, and we've done this in trial formats, the same exact whiskey, put it in the same exact type of barrel made in the same batch of barrels, same proof point, put them right next to each other in the warehouse, wait four years, the proofs could be incredibly different. The flavor profile will almost always be incredibly different, despite the fact that they're right next to each other. In fact, a lot of the single barrel program involves barrels from quality batches or best batches that have lived very close to each other, maybe right next to each other, but the flavor is night and day because again, the environmental impacts quite simply put, just that magic of maturation, that every chemical interaction that's happening in each closed off barrel is gonna be quite different from its neighbor. Based yeah. off the simplest things, maybe a little boring insect made a hole in that first barrel and, while the staves were seasoning outside and nobody noticed. And suddenly it's letting a lot more air in and it's letting a lot more oxidation happen. Or the staves could be slightly askew and it's letting more air in or it's got a slight leak, which is only gonna benefit the whiskey actually. All these little tiny components make it almost impossible to say exactly where X, Y, or Z flavor is coming from. but by understanding that, by knowing that every barrel is going to age differently, that's what makes a private barrel unique. That's what makes something like this have legs to stand on. Otherwise, we're just giving you a barrel at higher proof, where that is not at all the case here. And oftentimes, too, people who like bourbon, people who aren't quite into rye, it is actually the 10-year single barrel at a cast strength that gets them into the category, because there's so much flavor there without the compromise of that heat on the back end, you know, that you even. So I never like to count my chickens before they hatch. I think we should absolutely go back to these and we will after a little more time sort of to be absolutely certain. But I think based off what I'm picking off of you, these virtual vibes maybe, <laughs> and based off what I'm tasting right now, I think we've got a winner in barrel number three. I mean, it stands out to me, despite the positive herbaceous flavors, that uniqueness, that sort of nice light character in barrel number one, despite that really nice earthy weightiness, you know, a lot of palate weight, great finish on barrel number two, barrel number three just blows them out of the water. It's the yeah. whole package, like you said. That's ex you're exactly right. There, there is the, the barrel one. Again, it's that um, kind of reminds me of a, of a more Highland uh, scotch um, where it's delicate uh, and it's nice. It's very nice. Like if someone poured you a glass when you went to their house, you'd be pretty happy with that. Oh yeah. Yeah. But, but that would be because you hadn't tasted or I, you, know, you hadn't tasted barrel three. You'd be pretty happy with barrel one. I know, right? But knowing that barrel three exists, um, I, you know, I, I can't handle knowing that that might be in someone else's store. Thank you. I like that. You know what we call that, Michael? We call that first world problems, I think. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, man, don't worry. I'm going to hold these two first barrel samples tonight and cuddle them and say, don't worry, guys. You're still special. <laughs> you're, going, you're, going, you're going to go to a good home eventually. Don't yeah. worry. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, damn. All right. My palate's happy. And my palate's excited, too, because we're not done here at all, are we? No. Oh, Round yeah. two. Round, Round two. two. We've got something incredibly exciting to taste right here. So we're not just limiting ourselves with one private barrel program. We've got a number of different products out there from 10 to 12 to 15 to 18 with different private barrel programs. However, what's incredibly exciting about what we're about to taste is this is a brand new program. This is the first year, the first six months actually of this program. And you are one of the first 50 people to ever even taste these barrels, let alone think about purchasing one. This is our 15 year single barrel program. Now, what sets it aside from the, from the 10 year old pro uh, barrel program? What sets the 15 year barrel program aside from the 10 year barrel program. It's not just five years older, or I just told you these were 12 year old whiskeys. It's not just three years older. It's just as different from the regular 10 year as the regular 15 year is. Now, flavor profile is the biggest point here. This whiskey is so much different from the 10 year old, it's not even funny. It's whiskey that we've identified at eight, at nine, at 10 years old, at 12 years old, to say this is going into the 15 year. And here's why. It's making up the flavor profile that we look for in the 15 year. Much like I said with the 10 year, the 15 year is not an age statement. It's 
a minimum entry level requirement. We're blending various batches of barrels with various profiles, spicier, sweeter, a bit more char forward to evoke the regular flavor of 15. And without getting too deep into it, it's a little bit more difficult than it is with a tenure because we have to find these flavor profiles and then put them into a finishing cask, not just any finishing cask, a brand new charred and toasted Vermont oak finishing cask, which with, if treated improperly can really mess your whiskey up, add a lot of flavor that you're not quite looking for. So that's not where we sort of hang our hat. It's not just 15 years, it's not just finished in Vermont oak. It's actually up to 18 plus years because we're looking to find that complexity. Sometimes 16 year old whiskey might not have enough palate weight to really make up this blend, or it might not pull enough of that vanilla character from the Vermont oak itself. So we're really finding this perfect blend of different Vermont oak finished whiskey that before it even went into the finishing barrel, we've selected very carefully and blended together to meet that flavor profile. And then in a private barrel format, taking those few that really stand out at cast strength and saying these are worthwhile to give to the world. So the 15 year is brand new. It's an incredibly limited barrel program. We're selling at most 50 barrels this year. And that is if we think our barrels meet the quality. You know, we've sold a couple dozen at this point, but we're very much gatekeeping ourselves because we don't have you know, as much 15 year liquid as we have 10 year old liquid. I'd love that to be the case. Unfortunately, it's not quite. But that being said, the most special of 15 year, those are the only barrels that are ever gonna make it into the 15 year single barrel. They're cast strength, just like the 10 year are. They're gonna range from anywhere from probably 105 proof for the lowest up to over 125 proof. And again, they've been finishing in brand new charred and toasted Vermont oak. Charred meaning it was lit on fire and caught fire for anywhere from 15 to a minute, uh, 15 seconds to a minute long. Toasting being a much gentler heat treatment profile that we're familiar with in wine. But toasting is so important. It gives us such a range of flavors that I think we'll pick up on in these samples. And we'll wait to talk about the flavors themselves. But we're looking at a finishing length here for anywhere from one to six months old. And the samples that we're dealing with here are actually about four and a half months old in terms of finish. So these are 15 years minimum. They sat in brand new chart oak for 15 years minimum. And then we transfer them to a brand new charred and toasted oak container. So it's incredibly important to watch these like a gosh darn hawk and really make sure that we're only putting in the best stuff because it's so easy to overwhelm with that, to find a barrel that drinks at a higher proof at 113, at 114 or above with all this going on and retain that distillate character. Without further ado, I think we should at least take a little sip of these to know what we're dealing with here. I know for a fact that these whiskeys are going to be beautiful and wonderful, but they're going to be a lot different from the 10 And we're going to talk about the flavor itself, how that comes about. I'm excited. So for me, and this is a full disclosure event right here, this is what happens when you're dealing with two small businesses during a quarantine that's unprecedented like anything else. The fun fact is, this is such a limited program that I thought Michael was only going to get one sample. That's how limited it was. So I only got one sample myself from the farm. Lo and behold, apparently Michael's so special that he gets two different samples. Oh, oh I am that special. He is, so he is, oh, so it's confirmed. Okay. No, Table and Vine is that special. Table and Vine, okay. So apparently it's not Michael, but Table <laughs> and Vine is that special. They're getting two, which, hey, more power to you. I, honestly, in a perfect world, we'd have a thousand 15-year barrels. So you could taste through 10 of them, but unfortunately not the case. However, you get to taste two things that are fantastic side by side, much like we did with the 10-year, and you get to say, hey, guess what, buddy? Not quite, you know? You are fantastic, and any other person would be lucky to have you, but I'm privileged, and I get to say not quite. <laughs> So Michael's going to be tasting one more sample than I will. So I'm going to have to leave a lot of the tasting on his shoulders and a lot of the describing, but I'm here to talk with him and really discuss the flavors and what I tend to see in 15 year and 15 year single barrel. And I think that despite the fact that I only have one of these samples, we're going to be able to find a really nice barrel that fits in the table and vine profile. So you and I, the, the, the barrel that we have uh, together, right? Yes. Is 1366? 1366 indeed. And it is 113.6 proof, correct? Yes. Okay, awesome. There we go. So this barrel right here is actually, both these barrels, just knowing what's in the current lots for 15 year single barrel, they're 16 years old. So they're a bit above the age point of 15, which isn't always a net positive or net negative. You have to really watch your whiskey very carefully between that 12 and 18 year mark with rye whiskey with brand new charred American oak, because it could be as simple as one month in the summer and it's over extracted. Mm. Too much tannin, it's too astringent, it's too bitter on the back end, and suddenly you have an undrinkable whiskey. In, it's really, in, your, in your opinion, because um, I have kind of my own opinion, but is it possible to overage whiskey, whether it be bourbon, whether it be scotch? At 100%, absolutely. And we tend to see that most often in American whiskey. Simply put, because the law includes the use of new charred American oak. That new charred oak, let me back up a little bit. The charring process itself is what creates a lot of the flavor compounds. It also destroys a lot of negative flavor compounds that we don't necessarily want. For instance, a lot of the tannin, a lot of the greenwood notes. Mm. So what I'm 
making bourbon, I have to put it into a brand new charred American oak barrel, there's going to be a lot of new extracts to give. So therefore, I'm going to be a lot more likely to pull too much and not usually until about year 12, 15, perhaps later with bourbon, but consider scotch whiskey and most other world whiskeys. Almost, not 100% of the time at all, but very typically, scotch whiskey is employing used barrels. So that barrel that I just had charred and filled bourbon into after four years or six years, I'm dumping and I'm sending it to Scotland. And that scotch whiskey producer is going to fill that with their scotch whiskey. That's very significant because during that six or four years, so much of that barrel is being extracted. The color is a huge part. We were talking about color earlier quite a bit. A lot of that color is going to be gone, which is why you can have a 12-year-old scotch that's going to look incredibly light in color. It's also going to have exhausted a lot of the actual wood compounds. So therefore, in scotch whiskey, A, we're not going to have quite a woody of a whiskey early on, and B, we feel a lot more comfortable letting it sit for quite a bit longer. Mm. Additionally, they're using wine casks and scotch whiskey, which might have a different heat treatment profile. Sherry casks are going to be quite a bit larger in size, so it's going to be less likely to overwhelm the whiskey yeah. wood. But first and foremost is the fact that we are using brand new charred American oak with so much wood to give. The answer is 100 times 100% yes, no matter what, you will over oak your whiskey at a certain point if you just leave it in there. However, in Vermont, at least we've got a bit of a colder climate. Generally speaking, the hotter your climate, the drier your climate, the more aggressive your extraction is. With our colder climate, less aggressive maturation, we're not necessarily pulling quite as much of those compounds, which is why we can produce a whiskey like the 18 year that isn't over oak, that actually doesn't even hint at being over oak because it's through careful maturation sort of guidelines. That could be something as simple as, I know that this portion of the warehouse ages very slowly, so put this whiskey there for me because I know that I want to let this sit for another year or two at the very least before I even have it pull too much oak or begin to. But yes, the answer is yes. It's always a challenge for brands to try to get around that because you want to see old whiskey. You want to see 18-year-old, 21-year-old American whiskey, but you don't want to see it if it's not going to taste good, you know? Right. That's good. We've, you know, we've done in-store events where I thought, that not the youngest, but the the mid tier, like the 15 to 18s. Maybe it, it could be personal preference, but I, I find that those are more to my liking than the, the 21s or the 23s. Absolutely. Yeah. And especially with bourbon, bourbon versus rye, bourbon doesn't tend to hold its distillate character in the barrel for quite as long. It's a less aggressive, less punchy, less bold based distillate. So therefore, after 15 years, a bourbon might be heading south, whereas a rye might be going up until about 18 years or 20 years, depending. And the mash bill is going to be pretty significant to that. But these heavier mouthfeel components in rye, these spicier components, they're going to stand up a lot better to that barrel aging than a bourbon will because it's mostly corn forward. You know, it's a much more delicate grain yeah. flavor. So what are you picking up on this first barrel here, 1366, before I uh, start blabbing my mouth? Right off the bat, there's a... Uh kind of getting back to barrel number two, there's, there's a lot of that earthiness to it, you know, uh, oh, yeah. woods, this, very woodsy. Yeah. You know, great, not, great not, like, not like wood, but like, but as you mentioned, being in the woods, kind of that. Yeah. Uh, you know, that sort of humid woods. It's, it's a wet yeah, wood. You know, yeah. it's a bit charry too. It's funny to pick up the smell of char on the nose, but I do get a bit of that carbon mm -hmm. sort of charred barrel. And it's, for me, it's got some spice to it. It's got oh, some heat, but it's not overwhelming. No, you can definitely, you can kind of, you can feel it. You can feel the heat. And as I, again, as you would expect at, at 113, almost 114 proof, uh, there's definitely, a, there's, um, there's like a little bit of a, I get it, a little bit of clove, a little bit of cinnamon, you know, baking spices. The baking spices, absolutely. Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah, the clove in particular is a little heavier than some of the other ones, which is unusual, I think, but big time baking spices. It's kind of like the second fiddle to the earthy character in a sense. Yes. And it does give a, a hint of sweetness, but I would not say this is a sweet nose at all. Not in the nose, no. I actually, to be honest, I was expecting more. I was expecting yeah. to get hit with that big sugary sweet. And what's funny with the 15 year is oftentimes we do get some really sweet casts because from the charring process, you're gonna create a lot of wood sugars, which quite literally extract into your whiskey and taste sweet. However, every barrel is gonna be different. In this case, we seem to be getting a bit more of the char and the actual oak spice itself. With rye, there's multiple sources of spice, the distillate or the rye spice, as well as the actual oak extracts. And for me, yeah, I get a ton of that oak spice actually. Nice and pleasant, but on the mid palate, kind of with that earthy character, that char character, the side palate as well, lets me know it's there. It's not overly drying, but it's got a nice spice character to it. This is much cleaner than I would have expected for 113.6 too, on the finish. It's, it's pretty neat though, because oh, I, right, right around mid, right around mid palate, you get hit with, I get hit with some, uh, there's a little bit of tropical fruit, a little bit mm. of certainly some citrus notes too. Yeah, it's not like a sweet sort of fruit note, but it's a no, no, fruitiness, no, no. right? And then, you know, then you're getting the dry, the little fig. Little dry yeah, it's almost, it's like got a sort of like California Chardonnay fruitiness to it in a weird way on the palate for me. But as, again, a second fiddle note, it's not the predominant note for me. That mm. earthiness, that char, that oak spice, that rye spice too is definitely taking center stage. But it's one of those that I know that as I left to sit, I'm going to put some water in it too and do time. 
I'm going to yeah. get a lot of flavor variation here. And it's worth noting too, this is 100% rye by mash bill. The 10 year is about 95% rye per mash bill. I actually misspoke earlier, that's my apologies. The 15 year though is 100% rye coming from Alberta distillers up in Canada. So we're gonna have a bit more of that rye character inherent to the whiskey, despite that it's been in the barrel for at this point 16 years with a finishing cast on it. And I'm definitely getting some of the warmth that I picked up from barrel number three uh, for the 10 year on this guy as well. There's some heat on the back end, but it's more of a warmth, it's pleasant. And I'd like to talk about Vermont oak too for a moment. I mentioned that our whiskey is finished in brand new toasted and charred Vermont oak. Vermont oak is actually quite a bit different than most oak that's being used for whiskey making. Most of the oak that's felled and then coopered into barrels is actually coming from the south central region of the US, kind of the Daniel Boone National Forest, the Ozark Mountain Range. For us, 100% of our brand new whiskey goes into Vermont barrels, as well as our finishing of the 15 year. And what that means is we are logging wood from Vermont, white oak, we're sending it to our cooperage partner. And just as a quick aside, coopering a barrel is as much of an art as making whiskey. And if we try to do it ourselves, it would not be as good by leaps and bounds. Trust me on that. We'll send it over to our partners. They'll break it down into staves and they'll let it season out in the air for at least a year. They'll make it into barrels and then send it back to us with actually a special toast and char profile proprietary to us. And the Vermont oak itself, much like Vermonters, is a bit hardier. It's got a much tighter grain due to the fact that we've got a shorter growing season, as I alluded to earlier, in Vermont, the way that trees grow is we're basically looking at traffic cones that get stacked with each other year after year. And they grow up and they grow out. But for us, our growing season is so short, it's only about four months, those traffic cones can't really grow that far out or that far up. And the traffic cones are those rings that you see in a tree, which quite literally speaking, are the flavor compounds. The dark rings in a tree are late wood, which has all the flavor that we find appreciable. So having those rings tighter together means that when we turn that into a stave, we're going to get more rings per stave, which means we're going to have that much more flavor concentration per stave. But it's going to be a different flavor concentration than our classic straight up caramel, vanilla, oak spice coming out of that sort of South Central region. Actually, one of the interesting notes that you get is a bit of a citrusy note, along with all these other classic sort of American oak extracts. And I would venture, I guess, to say that that citrus tropical fruit note you're picking up is actually influenced by that finishing cast in this glass itself right, right here. I have a little extra knowledge knowing what this whiskey tasted like before it went to the finishing cast. No, we didn't really have those notes, but that Vermont oak is so unique in a finish or an aging brand new whiskey because it's got that tighter grain. It gives us a more heavy concentration of extracts, but at the same time, our maturation seasons are so much shorter and less intensive that we're not really worried about, to your earlier comment, over extracting the wood. There's so much wood concentration to give, but we're pulling at a slower rate that it really mitigates itself into this totally unique, one-of-a-kind aging environment up in Vermont in that sense. Yeah, as I let the sit, a little bit of those aromatics sort of come out towards the vanilla side, towards the almost butterscotchy side, but the predominant notes for me are still that punchy, earthy awry, that bolder sort of character. It sticks with me on the tongue. It doesn't overwhelm my finish though, which I'm definitely a fan of. Oh yeah, and a little bit of water in there actually brings down that earthy tone a bit. It lets a little bit more of those sort of sweeter barrel extract, the wood sugars come out and play. Some of this compound called HMF, which I love, which is kind of a toasted oak kind of flavoring. If you go to a cooperage and you see them toasting oak, you're like, oh damn, that is an unmistakable smell. But it actually smells quite a bit like toasting a marshmallow, believe it or not. That sweetness coupled with that fiery sort of char note to it, coupled with that oaky goodness, to put it quite simply. Yeah, you're right. A couple of, a couple of drops of water did temper down that. Um, it really did. Wow. Yeah. And, and so it tamped down almost everything except for on the back end, the char actually explodes a little bit more for me. This is a really interesting whiskey, I'd say. And not just as a Whistlepig 15-year, but among Whistlepig 15-year private barrels. It's definitely standing out on its own. And I'm remembering something you said earlier, which I won't spoil. And I'm starting to think a certain thing, which I'll tell you what it is later. Because we do have another sample to taste right now, don't we? Well, well yeah, exactly. Is, <laughs> I'm glad you caught that thing. <laughs> well, I'm sitting here like a, a, a like a Pavlov's dog here because <laughs> I'm trying to be very disciplined and and not go to the second glass. No, 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 no. Honestly, I would say one of the things about private barrel tastings is do what feels right. You know, if your palate's ready for taste number two, in fact, 
it probably means that I'm going to hurt you by making you wait if I'm doing that because whatever the reason is, you're salivating, your mouth is ready, you're thinking about this flavor in such a way and you take the sip of the other one and you really build a library in your own brain about what these flavor pathways look like. You know, I'm cheating you if I'm saying, no, 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 you wait, you wait to drink that, you know. Yeah, no, I, I'm glad you picked up on that. Yeah, Michael is even more privileged than the master blender for Whistlepig in that he gets to take two different samples of 15 year single barrel. I'll send you a sample at the end. You would? Wow, what a guy. <laughs> and tell us a little bit about this second sample right here. I oh, mentioned this earlier, it's 16 years old. It's from a similar batch, but that's all I got for you. Yep, it's uh, barrel number 1354. All righty. And what do you got for proof there, Michael? It's coming in at 104.3. Oh, wow. Okay, so we're looking at a quite a differentiation yeah. in terms of proof yeah. here, huh? 113.6 versus 104.3. Yeah, almost a 10-point swing. Man, I'm really upset I don't have this because I know the flavors are going to be all over the place in a good way in terms of differentiation. But I'd be so excited if they weren't because that speaks to that magic of maturation where you could have 10 proof points differentiation in very similar whiskeys for whatever the reason. There's tons of earthiness on this one as well. Yeah. But I feel like I can... Because I'm not getting the heat that I got off of the first sample, they almost become more prominent and, and actually more e easily detected. Interesting. And would you say that's a positive or a negative in your experience? I would say that, that I'm, I'm kind of neutral on it. Interesting. You know? um, because if you like earthiness, then you might not want that to be a dominant flavor. Um, I gotcha. If you do like it, then you know, you're going to be wanting, you're be wanting to, to, uh, to have it screaming out of the glass. So it's a polarizing whiskey in that, say, in that sense, maybe. You know, I, I love it or hate it. In a way, um, I think the first one is, is a little bit polarizing. Okay. Having, you know, I think I, I have a feeling that they're both going to end up being somewhat polarizing. Interesting. In their own way. A lot of the times I'll get a 15 year barrel sample that's so different and unique. It reminds me of one of our Boss Hog releases, which is Boss Hog 3. Boss Hog 3 was actually finished in decharred, recharred Isla Hog Sandus. So a bit larger format cask that previously held smoky, punchy scotch in it from Isla. Uh, undisclosed uh, distillery, but one of the punchier, smokier ones, which we then decharred and recharred, scraped the inside off and recharred it, but it still retained a lot of the smoke character. And we finished a 13 and a half year old rye whiskey in that for only two weeks. It picked up not a lot of the smoke, but just enough mm. that it was one of those where you take a sip and you either love it or you hate it. And it's people's favorite boss hog by leaps and bounds or they cannot stand it. And at the end of the day, there's something to be said for that. You know, whiskey, I'd like for everybody to drink it. I'd like to make whiskey that's appealing to everybody, but that's one of the magical things about whiskey, isn't it? Is that whiskey isn't for everybody and every whiskey is not for everybody. If you ask somebody how they feel about Isla Peated Scotches, they're either gonna say they love it or they hate it. Or maybe they're on the fence, you know, in the middle, but it's one of those sort of ideologies that we wouldn't have regions of scotch making, of scotch production rather, if there wasn't significant differences across the board. And there wouldn't be people saying, I love Highlands Peat, but I can't stand Isla Peat if it wasn't sort of differentiated for a reason. And I love the fact that people can say, I love sweet, I hate dry, or vice versa, or yeah. I'm willing to try, you know, I'm willing to branch out a little bit and have those polarizing whiskeys. Whiskey I think, you, I think it is polarizing. You have to have the, the flavor variances in order to warrant having, I, you know, I, I'm estimating that we have a couple hundred, oh gosh, definitely have a couple hundred whiskeys. When you put all everything in, Canadian, Irish, Scotch, Kentucky, Vermont, every, you know, what, what's the point in carrying them all if they don't taste different? You know? Absolutely. Number one for me has actually opened up really nicely and I did not expect that. After the addition of a couple drops of water and then letting it sit, the nose is very creamy. Very creamy, a bit softer, a bit sweeter, but not overwhelming, which is surprising to me. It really is only sat for about five minutes here. So barrel number two, or yes, 15 year barrel number two. It, it feels like it's more integrated. And by okay. that, I guess I mean that where there are so many, there are a lot of interesting components to the first barrel. Like I think, you know, you can kind of pinpoint some different aspects. It's a, barrel number two, it seems to have more well roundedness, but I don't know if that's necessarily a good thing. You know, I mean, I'm, what does your palate tell you? And it, I think there's a word you're looking for, for here that I love with whiskey, which is cohesive. Does it feel more cohesive? It you know? does feel more cohesive. Maybe it's the, the lower proof. Um, I, I don't know if it's as interesting as the okay. you don't, okay. you know, so I, I, I like it. I definitely like both of them. Um, but I, I, it's definitely more cohesive, which is, a, which is exactly what I was trying to say. But I don't know if it has the, the, the wow factor. Cohesive doesn't necessarily mean better, does it? You know, it, it doesn't. It, it's, that's tough too. And I mean, we even look at 
factors beyond just flavor when it comes to private barrels. Although flavor should and always does take center stage, certain people won't buy whiskey at cast strength unless it's cast strength in their mind, unless it's 130 proof or above, you know? In Texas, a lot of our private barrels, you know, we send out a sample with a range and we know they're probably gonna pick the highest in the range regardless of flavor, just because that's their market, you know? Sometimes people look at a barrel and this is part of the idea of knowing your consumers, you know? You might know that, oh my God, this 100.2 proof, 10 year is the greatest thing I've ever tasted, but no one's gonna buy it because my customer base is all about higher proof. And if they see something that's only 0.2 proof points above the regular 10, they're yeah. gonna scoff. At other establishments, people know you pick the best goddamn barrels. And there's gotta be a reason you're picking 100.2. And in fact, that's gonna only serve to make them more willing to buy that whiskey. But that's that idea of knowing your customer base. Do they appreciate something that's a little less challenging or more cohesive, a little lower proof, a little less dangerous, or are they more into something that's a bit more fiery, a bit more adventurous? And even something like price point with this, that's gonna definitely add a bit of a higher price point for the 15 year single barrel. Definitely going to sort of be a gatekeeping aspect for some people where some people will consider buying it or not based off price point alone. So all these things to consider really make it that much more challenging than picking a private barrel. Because again, you're not picking it for yourself. You're picking it for your people, you know? And do they want higher strength, but at the sacrifice of that cohesion, of that really nice complexity of flavor, and my mouth is watering thinking about that freaking second barrel right now, gosh darn it. Or do they want something a bit punchier, you know, a bit more aggressive, a bit more unique, you know? And not unique in the sense that, oh, we could find another barrel like barrel number two any day, but unique in terms of what you have in front of you. You know for sure right now that number one is a bit more, again, unique or maybe not special, but different in a lot of ways than maybe number two is. But does that make it better? So yeah. almost philosophical issues of barrel picks here, aren't they? Well, it's, 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 it's a very interesting way of looking at it. Is, and that, that sums it up, is barrel number one has a, a more unique profile. Barrel number two is a little bit more, um, I don't know, common's not the right word, but I guess maybe expected. It has a more expected profile. I like that. That's a good, I like that descriptor. Um, and I will also add, you know, we had talked earlier about, I, I had cheated a little bit. And yeah, I, right, right. Oh my God, I can't wait to hear this. Okay. So I thought I had my mind made up. Maybe, no, I thought I did. When we, before we, because I, I really loved the nose on barrel number one. And yeah. there was something, there was something that just wasn't right for me on barrel number two, but I'm about to go 180 here, I think. Oh, no way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I, now I'm going to jump in real quick because this is a perfect segue into what I was thinking, which is, this is not how we usually do a barrel pick, obviously. Usually Michael would come to our farm, we'd hang out together, we'd have dinner, we'd spend the day picking a barrel, not just one hour, two hours. And I would encourage you to do the same, whereas you might be able to make a decision right now, but I would strongly encourage, take your time. Give it a couple hours, wait until tomorrow, revisit, you know, sort of step into my shoes. When I'm tasting whiskey for any reason, I'm doing it all day long. Granted, not in the way that sounds fun, but I'm pouring whiskey the second I get into work or the second I get up, just because my palate's gonna evolve throughout the day. In the morning, it's gonna be very on point, depending on what I did the night before, granted, but it's gonna be very on point. I haven't eaten anything, I haven't tarnished it. You're gonna get a much better idea of the whiskey. I mean, in this case, you won't have some guy yelling at you how good the whiskey is. You know, you'll be able to take a second and really think about it. And I encourage people on the farm, if they're there for three days and the barrel pick's only scheduled for about three or four hours on one day, look at it as a three day experience rather than a four hour experience because you're gonna get such a better idea of your whiskey with more time. With that being said, I would highly encourage you to do the same, to take a little bit of time, but even just to tell yourself that you were right. Because what better feeling is there than saying, God damn it, I was right, you know, mm. upon second, third, fourth visit. I think with the tenure, we, we reached a pretty good consensus and point here. But yeah. again, just like to your point earlier, you might taste that again and be like, oh man, I was wrong. I, I don't know, man. <laughs> I was like, I, I understand what you're saying about that one, but that just seemed, uh, the tenure just seemed so... Yeah. Who am I kidding? I mean, so it's, de it's definitely barrel three. It's let's definitely be barrel number three. <laughs> I've actually gone so far as to circle it and mark it off just to oh, make sure that I see yeah, the I actual already. submission for it. I've done the same. <laughs> yeah, this 15-year sample that I have, which is the first barrel, again, it keeps on opening up. I have added a little bit of water, but it keeps on opening up. And that's that, the, the notion of it's hard to get a snapshot of a whiskey. And to call back my earlier story of the guy who was doing an eight-barrel tasting, and I look over at him, we're on barrel number five, and I watch him take the glass and just go, whoop. And I look at glasses one through four and they're just empty and it's noon. And I'm like, oh my God, this guy's had basically four drinks now, five drinks now of cast strength whiskey. You know, you gotta let people take their time. There is a certain pressure aspect too, you know, that comes into play. It's not easy to decide the fate of Table and Vine's customers for the rest of forever, you know? And I know that every, you've got these, I mean, for your guys' reference, Michael has these great 200 mil samples. That's plenty for several different sessions. And I'm confident that, oh yeah, there you go. That's a 15 right there. I'm confident that, you know, I mean, they wouldn't be a Wissapig account if they weren't 
that higher tier. Whiskey, you guys wouldn't be at all. To your point earlier, you're not selling Jack Daniels, you know, which no knock against Jack Daniels, but you're a cut above the rest. You know? I'm going to just say something very simple about my sample of 15 year. I like this. <laughs> It's tough because, as we said earlier, if, uh, if I went over to someone's house and they poured me a glass of barrel number one, yeah. I'm going to be a pretty happy guy. Yep. Oh, yeah. It's, it's that ignorance is bliss mentality, right? Yes. You know what? On this 15-year, too, this might sound sacrilege, but just based off of what I've been getting on nose and palate, I really want to make, and I probably will later tonight, out of my sample bottle, an old-fashioned with this, with some maple syrup, actually, instead of uh, sugar. Mm. I really feel like this would complement that beautifully. Back and forth, back and forth. Oh, yeah, exactly. All right, I'm going to write you a check for $100 million if you can tell me which barrel it is right now. Which barrel is it? This is purely rhetorical. You're not or theoretical, really, rather. You're not really cutting me that check, are you? I mean, does this look like a checkbook enough to you or no? <laughs> My favorite thing to do, by the way, is ask that question or something along the lines and then say, are you sure? But are you really sure? You know, I, it, the point is, you know, it's not a gun to your head decision. It's something that should take time and should, you know, if we can't come to a decision right now, then more power to you. That just means that this peril is even more special is, you know, there's a bit more thought put into it than somebody who just took a sip and said, that's the one, yeah. no knock against them, but that's a fact of the matter. I think, you know, when we were doing the 10 year, there, there was that barrel, there was barrel number three, that was, that's the one, which was in a way good because it was so much uh, you know, a cut above the others. Oh yeah. But, yeah. But with these two 15s, um, I, I'm leaning towards one, three, three, four, well, Nine, one, oh. three, five, four, pardon me. One, three, five, one, three, five, four. So the one that I don't have. Okay. Right. Right. The one that, again, I thinking about it from a consumer standpoint and what are they going to, you know, that I love the idea that it's cohesive, that it, that it's, that it's balanced. There isn't anything, you know, there isn't a characteristic that's going to jump out at someone. You know where because if you if I if we decided on barrel number one yeah. or for the 15 year which is you know earthy as heck and you know and and if you don't like earth yeah if you don't it's like, a, yeah get a, yeah it's a bomb for sure right and it might be off putting to you where I you know I'm leaning that that one three five four is um going to engage more customers and I think at the end of the day that's what it's all about is having the wherewithal to say that you know to say okay here's the facts you know as much as this might stand out I think this is the right call and I I mean I wish I had the whiskey to taste with me but. Based off our earlier tastings and how in agreement on point we were with tasting notes and everything, I couldn't agree more in the sense that, you know, one of these whiskeys is a risk, but is it too much of a risk, you know? And you're saying cohesive, but maybe boring or less exciting than the other one. Doesn't mean boring though. No, you, no. Yeah. yeah. And you, and here's another thing to consider is you've been very fortunate to be able to taste side by side and you know what you're missing out on if you choose one or the other. But if you can take a second and just look at that one whiskey by itself, you know, just yeah. like you said, with if somebody poured me glass number one and I went over, I'd be more than happy. Try to work in that vacuum. And I guarantee you, you're going to say, God damn, okay, I'd be more than happy to have this. Oh, absolutely. You know? yeah. And that's at the end of the day, it's so tough. It's like, we're so privileged. You know, we've got so much to work with. We don't want to let a good thing go. You know, we don't want to say one thing is better than the other when they're both really good. And it's really hard. I mean, for me, it's almost personal because I'm saying like, oh, you know, you barrel, like, I don't love you. I don't right. care about for you. For you, it's, it's going to be like, you know, I don't know if you have kids or not, but it's like trying to pick a favorite kid. I do. They're made out of wood and they hold whiskey. <laughs> I'm like, I only have one. So she has yeah. to be my favorite. Well, there you go. But imagine if you had a second child, you know, for whatever reason, and you had to choose. And, you know, not only did you have to choose, but you have to look them in the eye and say, hey, guess what? No, it's not You're you. Not her. You're yeah. not it's not easy. There's a lot of pressure right there. But I do appreciate that mentality, that foresight. And if I had to put my hat in the ring for one, I'd say barrel number two because you seem so much more sure about yourself. And you're right that barrel number one is more of a risk. Some people will enjoy this, but I guarantee you at least one person will be put off by it or yeah. have a challenge with it because it's not a flavor for everybody, much like an Isla Scotch is not a flavor for everybody. Whereas number two is a bit more, simply put, cohesive. It's a bit more rounded, you know? I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm gaining confidence in, in my decision, actually, because, um, because I thought it was going to be barrel number one. Okay. It started, you know? So I think the fact that you know if it was barrel number one and i like barrel number one better then it would be better than you know no fuss no muss yeah, right. moving along but the fact that i'm actually by tasting it really working through it um which i think i think for those of you that that are at if you're just a whiskey you know if you go to table nine you buy a bottle and, and peter to your point if if you only know that one whiskey then it, it's pretty easy you yeah, right you buy the whiskey you pour it into a glass you either add rocks or you don't you either make a cocktail or you don't you know and but not that the, 
I'm not, you know, I'm not looking for sympathy here. This is not like it's a, a hey, this oh, is, well, with you. Yeah. you know, oh, oh God, woe is me. But, um, but I think it's really great for our customers to get insight into the thought process of why we make the decisions we make, how we come to them. And the fact that it's not just throwing darts at a board. Oh yeah. And what we hit, you know, there's, um, there's, there's passion from, from, from Vermont. The passion, you know, flows down into Massachusetts and oh, yeah. you know, we, we all, we, we all, we could have done a thousand other things in our life for, for a living. I mean, we chose this path. So indeed. And, for that. Oh yeah. And people out there seem to trust us for some reason to give them. I, you know, know, that's what I haven't figured out yet. Me neither, but you know, <laughs> it keeps on happening. So <laughs> yeah, I mean, you hit the nail on the head right there. I'm seriously. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to pencil in barrel number one, three, five, four. And that's how it should be. And I would strongly encourage you. If you right now were saying I'm going for it right now, I'd be like, Hey man, Take a second. You're probably right. In fact, I think you're right. But you're only going to prove yourself right by tasting it later on the next day. You know, your palate changes so much. I used to actually joke that, you know, it's almost a benefit for me to be hungover and try to taste whiskey because I've got a totally different idea of my palate of where that's coming from. Or to be incredibly full of like 12 year old cheeses or to be, you know, just having no palate and have a cold or whatever it is because I yeah. get a snapshot of that whiskey in a different way and then I can build that full picture. Same exact deal. Now, and it definitely behooves you as a buyer in this case to take your time and, you know, you oftentimes your gut reaction is your final decision. Anyways, you know, our gut reaction to whiskey number one, which I'm about, or number three, rather, which I'm about to take another sip of, was correct. I mean, we yeah. never changed that. This is the winner, but let's do our due diligence, you know. And we, went, and we did. We worked backwards, too. We went back, right? Well, I know I did. I'm sure you did, too. I went back to one and two just to validate it, and, and three was, was a cut above. So. And I can say right now, after going back to it again, absolutely, we made the right choice here. But with the 15-year, you're on the fence, and that's there's no harm, no foul in that. That's huge, you know. That's There's wisdom in that, you know. So I think, uh, yeah, I think I'm going to, I'm, I'm tentatively going with uh, 1354. Great. I think what I'll do is um, just probably revisit it later tonight. Yeah, uh, again, no rush, man. I mean, take your time. Take a couple of days if you need it. I don't want to rush you. I don't want to push you into a decision. If you don't have the time tomorrow to give it due diligence, just push it back. You know? Okay. I'd rather have you make it the best decision possible than make it sooner than later. You know? Yeah. I think I mean, the good news is I don't think there's going to be, whether it's one or two, they're both, they both have their, their own merits. I, I love it. You know, That's so awesome. Be pretty happy with that. Oh yeah, good deal, man. This number three, I'm I'm saving the sample for myself. I know, I'm gonna pour this whiskey back into the bottle and save it. Amazing. And then we'll go find the barrel itself, steal it, tell you, hey, guess what, man? I'm really sorry. Oh, there's a theft. Did, did that one break? The barrel. You guys <laughs> dropped it. Yeah, we told you know it happens all the time. It does, <laughs> it does happen every now and then. Actually, barrels are very sturdy, but if you hit them just right with something and the head just breaks in, I don't even want to have this conversation, Peter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you never know. Barrel number eight five zero six two might not be around. You know, after today, if I can get to the farm in time with a forklift, you start it right now. <laughs> don't even talk like that. I'll come, there, I'll come up there and bottle it by hand. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, yeah, I'm definitely gonna be stepping on this tonight for sure. I'm gonna put this fifteen year in an old fashioned myself. I think I'll make my girlfriend make it because she's way better at cocktails than I am. <laughs> and I think I'm gonna sip on this uh, ten year neat while I'm waiting for it. That's a good plan. Oh yeah. Well, uh, I want to just thank you so much for your time. It was such an awesome experience. Like I learned so much, not even not even tasting whiskey. Uh, the the deep dive into the whistle pig and, and what sets it apart is um, was just fantastic. I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Yeah, this was such a great experience for me. Like I said, I'm also from Mass, so anytime I can spend any amount of time with anybody from Mass, I'm like, yes, I jump at the opportunity. Don't even care what it is. But for this, I mean, what an experience for you to have it be your first time tasting whiskey in a private barrel selection format, but to have it be like you, somebody who's been doing it for 10 years, because you come from that wine background, you understand your consumers, you know that this isn't just a, oh, let's taste these real quick and pick the first thought, there's care, there's time that's put into it. And you obviously have passion for it. Passion identifies passion, more power to you and your people. And really, I'm just upset that this couldn't be at the farm itself in person. Yeah. The silver lining is that, you know, this does get to go out a little bit more. People get to see what a barrel pick, at least in COVID world, means you know yeah. and what we talk about what we think about and the fact that again we're not just tasting whiskey and saying this is it you know yep. there is a lot of fun that goes into it so thanks so much for having me i can't wait to get back on i'll definitely come by your guys locations down in mass when i'm down there which is decently frequently and i can't wait to get to the farm when things get at least a little bit back normal but for I'm now forward to that as well man you guys pick some winners for sure here again i'm gonna be sipping on this 10 year all night i'm gonna definitely have an old fashioned with 15 year later which you know i might be feeling it tomorrow but it's gonna be well worth it my friend oh absolutely worth it I just wanted to have a wrap up there because I have a um I have a three o'clock call coming in so I, just to let you know I have to oh damn yeah I didn't realize the time no for sure that's perfect for me too because I've got to kind of hop on the horn here and yeah um but thanks so much seriously oh, that was a great you. experience that was really cool yeah I mean we just kind of I love it too we didn't really have a run a show we just went for it and it worked beautifully you know with the 50, I'm glad that you agreed with me that we shouldn't pretend like I have both samples of 15 years it's just more <laughs> fun and it's more you know it's it's true it's real like yeah, you know, yeah. it was a real sort of thing. 
I'm just really lamenting the fact that I can't taste it right now. Granted, I'll taste it tomorrow, but yeah, I'm, I'm not even joking about this this uh, Kenya right here, the 109.6. That thing is I, amazing. Oh my yeah, God. I, luckily, I know that this barrel probably has a little bit more gallon-wise than you actually need, so I can wait until it gets dumped and then just kind of, hey, what's yeah. that? And sample bottle some of the rest of it. You, know? you can say we used M2P? Totally, Jess. That's exactly what I'm saying. Yeah. No, that's when you come <laughs> was from Absolutely. That was awesome. I know. I... I message Maria and I was like can, can you send me the recording because I realized <laughs> I wasn't taking as many notes as I should have oh like, gotcha well it was all lies just, so don't actually <laughs> yeah no I'm just kidding no that was great seriously I, I love these sort of more freeform more lackadaisical not as you know not that anything's ever super cut and dry or anything but this is you know what we, all about. We've, we've been doing this for I don't know Maria what a month or so or you know I'm like man I'm shooting videos on my deck yeah yeah right, right. I can see that totally how stuffy should I be I you know probably not there <laughs> Yeah, I actually, this is not how my apartment looked before COVID. I <laughs> set this up specifically so I had like a decent kind of, and actually full disclosure, you probably can't tell what this is. Dave. I just want you to know you are not. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Oh, yeah. Um, gonna, it's so funny. My, my dog is, he's a, is sleeping at my feet. So like, oh, I, no can't, I can't move without stepping on him. And this is the best he's been in all of the videos that we've done. This See? is the only one that he hasn't made a guest appearance well I, it's funny you say that i actually locked the cat in the spare bedroom because she will always come through and not you know usually turn her butt directly to the camera <laughs> which if it's a regular zoom call in the company i'll leave it on i'll let her come in i'll encourage it but something like this i think it's a little more professional to have no camera in the frame my dog does right now um so really quickly so i know michael you have to go you decided on your tenure but you're gonna have to think on you want to think on the 15. yeah i i'm, I'm gonna i'll call it i'm calling it one, one, three, five, four. I think that's a move. I, yeah. I mean, time is definitely great for it, but you, you know, I mean, and your points are huge, you know, that sort of the, the across the board, more massive appeal. It doesn't mean it's worse at all. I, I just felt like I, because I, and again, I, we talked about it earlier, but like the fact that my mind was made up before I even went into it, but I was still like, mm, I don't, I think I'm wrong. Like, believe me, I, <laughs> Maria knows I don't lack in confidence. <laughs> so for me to question myself uh, was like, mm, that's a pretty good barrel of, of interesting. Of, so Oh, you want? Perfect. Yeah. Well, send, yeah. Yeah, send me the um, send me what it is, and then Michael, if you have to, if you have to jump off, but yeah, I think it does just say. Yeah, little barrel uh, will 